Revelation chapter 12, and let's look at the last verse. Tonight, uh, we want to talk about the last of the faithful. And here's what the Bible says. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I have never been able to do this on my own. Anytime it sounds good, it's, it's you. Anytime it's not good, it's me. Anytime it, it makes sense, it's you. Whenever it doesn't make sense, that's me. So tonight, overshadow me. You take charge. You connect everything. You let your glory be seen. I'm willing to disappear if you will simply allow us to see your power. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Bible says that Jesus has some people who are the remnant of the seed of this woman. Now let's, let's be real clear. I'm not going to get all that deep in it because either you're there or you're not. But trust me, these wim woman symbols, women as symbols, represent churches. I thought at least ladies would say amen. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of late, but welcome. I, I, you know, I'm not altogether comfortable with that. I think men ought to represent churches. But uh, something happened. We didn't get in that one. So we'll, we'll just look other places, brethren. But uh, this woman, you will see later what happens to her. But trust me, the woman represents people who Jesus is calling to be his last faithful ones. Now here's what I got to tell you about this uh, selection. I began by telling you that Jesus does not need people who everybody would vote the most religious. Huh? Because you know, you, you, you can fool some of the people. How does that thing go? Some of the time? Well, I'm not going to go all the way through it. You know it. But God knows who you are inside. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So somebody looking at me right now has never been thought of as a religious person. But I promise you that when Jesus gets ready to select his last faithful representatives, he will not go according to what everybody says about you. He will not go to the people who look holy. In fact, sometimes I worry about people who try to look holy. If Jesus lives in your life, you don't have to try to do anything. The Bible does not say, make your light so shine before men. It says, let your light so shine. So if the Lord dwells in you, you don't have to make anything happen. He just shines out. But, but what I want you to know is this, and, and it's important for you to know, because there are some people who exclude themselves from things that are in the Word of God because they say, that's not for me. That's for religious people. Well, got news for you. People are going to be shocked who Jesus chooses to represent him. Because you don't have to look religious. You don't have to dress a certain way. All you got to do is obey what the Bible says. And I am begging you not to exclude yourself from this because I believe that Jesus is going to choose some very ordinary people. He's going to use you to represent him. And you don't have to please anybody else. All you got to worry about is pleasing him. So let's begin with that recognition. Having done that, let's look at what the people are going to be like. Uh, this text, I'm going to read it again in the NIV. It says, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So if you're willing to do what God says, simple, 
Just obey him. You don't have to take an opinion poll. You don't have to go and meet with a group and say, can I get in? You don't have to have anybody's approval to be in this group. All you got to do is obey what God says. It says these people who represent me at the end will keep my commandments. And it says they will have the testimony of Jesus. If you go uh, to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, it will tell you that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now there are some people who think they can narrow it, define the spirit of prophecy. What it is, is to take what the prophets say in the word of God, along with anyone else who may fit into the category selected by God and obey the prophets. So if you obey the commandments and if you are willing to listen to the prophets that God sends, you are automatically in the category who Jesus calls to represent him at the end of time. And I'm going to state it from the beginning. Sometimes I like to keep something till the end to be dramatic. Tonight I'm not going to try and be dramatic. I'm going to tell you that in a few moments, let me say it that way, things in this world are going to change. Hmm? Can you feel it? <laughs> I will not get into partisan politics. What I'm talking about is way bigger than that. What I'm talking about is the times around us that let us know, even if you've never opened a Bible before, you can feel that something is different now than it used to be. I, I'm not going to just talk about the wickedness of people. I'm not just going to talk about uh, the wars and rumors of wars, even though the Bible said that at the end of time those things would happen. Nations shall rise against nation. That is happening now more than it's ever happened before. God even said there will be storms in diverse places. There will be earthquakes. There will be all kinds of pestilences. But that's not even what I'm talking about. We have come to a time now when you can barely find people who want to resemble the God of heaven in any shape or form. In fact, there are people who brag. <laughs> I don't believe in that. Who? What is with this Christian thing? Well, you stay right on that note. And you're going to discover something that when times begin to change, when principalities and powers are crushed, when institutions lose their power, and I say it to you with authority, that there will come a time when all of the things that we used to trust in will crumble. Now I will say this, our nation used to be the one that would send representatives to go and help other nations have elections in a peaceful way. Hmm? Now I suppose we ought to call other nations and ask them to come and help us. But that too is a sign because every institution that is not connected with the power of Christ will begin to sink over the horizon and you will discover that you can't trust what you used to trust. Well, you can see the changes in the world. I won't linger too long on that. Why should I tell you what you already know? Let me tell you what we have discovered in the Word of God. First of all, you remember that we discovered that there was a group of people who studied the Bible, who came to prophecies that said in 2,300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. They studied it very carefully, discovered that in the Bible, when it's prophecy, it's a day for a year. They said, okay, it's 2,300 years. Where do we start it? They studied it again. They found out that when it starts, it's 457 B.C. They went around and accounted for the year zero, they, when, when the changing, rather, of the years. Then they got to 1,844. I had somebody already tell me, you mean there's something in the Bible? About 1844, that's a long time ago, but it's not long in biblical history. And the Bible had a prophecy. You and I know what it says because we reviewed it. In 1844, the Bible declares that Jesus, our high priest, moved from the holy place to the most holy place and began the last phase of judgment. 
Anybody who's in Christ doesn't have to worry. Because in Christ, your sins are covered by the high priest's blood. Can you imagine? In fact, let that be our first experience, the power moment for tonight. The high priest whose blood is shed for my sin. If I've got a relationship with him, he can say, my blood, Father. So when he comes across some imperfection in my life, Jesus says, I know him, and he knows me. So my blood covers him while I continue to make him what I represent him to be. Is there power in that? Now let me show you something else that happens in uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. You got to go home and check me on this because I can't read it all. But the fact is that the Bible says this woman was about to do something different. In fact, it starts with the fact, this is Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, and then verses 13 and 14. A third of the angels have already fallen because of this great red dragon. Now I'm going to... I'm not going to try to scare you tonight, but I could. Huh? You know, red dragon keep you up. And I got a way I could preach it, I promise you. If I just wanted to make you amazed and in awe, I could twist it around. But nothing in the Bible frightens you if you're in Christ. And it's not difficult to get in Christ because he knocks at your door and says, let me in. How many believe that? Yeah. The Bible says so. So, listen, you don't have to be afraid of anything in here so long as you're willing to just say, come on in. And he will make changes in your life. But the fact is that I could frighten you with this one. Uh, the symbol in Revelation is a red dragon. Now, in the Bible, I can tell you who the dragon is. Not difficult to find out. Doesn't take rocket science. Who do you think the dragon is? Amazing audience. Amazing. Amazing. The devil. So the Bible says that this red dragon sees that the woman is about to give birth. And if it can devour the child, guess who the child is? Ah, if the church... Remember, it, the woman represents church. If God's church is about to give birth to a child, that child is the Son of God, Jesus, born of a virgin. The, the Holy Spirit overshadows a woman, and she's about to give birth. So in this symbolism, the woman, and let's identify the woman. The, the Bible says that she's wearing the sun. Does that give you a hint? Go see if you can buy that. There is no boutique anywhere on earth where you can dress in the sun. But if you are the woman who represents God's church, you can be dressed in the glory of the New Testament gospel, which is the sun. Do you see it? Then it says that she is standing on the moon, which is the predict predictions of the rites of the Old Testament. She has a crown with 12 stars. It represents both the 12 fathers of the Old Testament tribes and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. Is that, is that a way to dress? I'm never going to preach on how people ought to dress in particular, but if you look at the women in Revelation, you'll see that one of them dresses with all kinds of natural things. And then there's another one we'll talk about one day who doesn't dress so well. But this woman has the apostles, the fathers of the tribes of Israel. She's standing on the moon, the predictions of the Old Testament. She's clothed in the sun. And this woman is about to give birth to a child and the dragon. And y'all can't wait until she has that child. Because if I can kill that child, then hope is gone. What would have happened if Jesus could have been killed? You know that there was a death penalty out on all of the children born at that time. If the devil could have, he would have killed Jesus as a baby. But there were angels watching over that child. There was the Holy Spirit's power there. And so here's what the Bible says says that when, when that dragon came to, to spring forth to get the baby, 
the Bible says that the child was caught up to God at his throne. Now, you, I don't know whether you see that or not. Some of us have been looking at too much television. We can't imagine anything. I can see it. I see that dragon waiting to get the baby. But, but God's power is, is there. And so just when the dragon, just when the devil thinks that he can take the life of that child, uh, then he's caught up. Now, that's fast-moving time. But you and I know what it means. When Jesus had gone to the cross, when he had lived a perfect life and died a perfect death, then God said, you will not do anything else to this child. I will bring him up with me. And so Jesus went to sit at the right hand of God. But more importantly, he was there to be in the heavenly sanctuary to be my high priest. So if anybody thought they were going to take away the Savior, they were wrong. I would never, I would never have my influence on that side. So the baby was caught up. Now, here's what the, the dragon does, the devil does. He says, if I can't get Jesus, I'll get his believers. Huh? I can't get, can't get him? He's gone? Then everybody... Whoever professes to believe in Christ, I will give them trouble. Is there a witness anywhere in this room? I've had people to say to me, once I came to believe in Christ, I had more trouble then than before. Hey, guess what? You know the reason why you had more trouble? Because before you were walking with the dragon. Huh? Dragon don't worry about you. He knows he'll take care of you later. Nobody plays with the dragon and lives. He will destroy you, but not now. Come on, let's walk. There are people who think that there's something wonderful about going the way of Satan, but Satan is not your friend. In fact, he comes to make war with those who believe in Christ. Because let me tell you what he knows. He was cast out of heaven. But if you keep believing in Jesus, you will finally live in the place where he cannot return. <laughs> oh, I like to think about it. Sometimes when my life gets a little difficult, I do think about it because the devil has already made his choice. He can't go back. But if we just keep on believing in Jesus, you and I will live in those resting places. Rent will not be charged. It's already been paid by the blood of Jesus. There'll be no mortgage on the mansion. It's already been paid, and there will be nobody to come and say the taxes have been raised. There'll be no taxes. Not only no taxes, no tears, no, no pain, no disease. And the devil knows that if you keep on believing in Jesus, you're going to go where he's been. The difference between regular horrible people And the devil and those one-third of the angels, they know what heaven is like. Yeah, I don't know. The Bible says, eyes seeing, see not, ears hearing, hear not, but the Spirit reveals. I know you didn't read that little part, did you? Every now and then I'm walking around praying, Lord, help me, and he'll say, Whoa! and I'll see a little glimpse of what heaven is like. And that's why you can't get on my nerves, because... I'm thinking about another city. <laughs> Just when I think all is lost, the Spirit reveals to me where I'm going. Have you ever been riding down the street? I don't want to talk specifically about Washington, D.C., even though our traffic is quite interesting. Have you ever been riding along and somebody, I don't know what gets in folks' minds, they'd start darting in and out in front of you. And I don't know, maybe you're way more close to Jesus than I am. <laughs> I, I have some thoughts. 
And you know, I, I drive a funny looking truck and I got weight advantage. And, you know, when it, some of them little, little tiny cars come zip, zip, zip. And, Yeah, you let me roll this up close to you. <laughs> and then I think about it. I don't know who that person is. They may have nowhere to go. They may have nothing to live for. Their life may be full of nothing but trouble. Here I am with somewhere on my mind. So I just slow down and let them dart in and dart out. Because I got somewhere to go. So when the devil gets on your nerves, you need to remind yourself he has nowhere to go, nowhere good. But if you just hold on to Jesus, you've got an appointment to keep. Slow down, let him play, it won't last long. So, so watch this. Let me, let me show you what happens with this piece of prophecy. Uh, this is, well, let me turn into this because you've got to see it. This is Revelation chapter 12, and let's get a piece of it because if it don't, somebody will say, well, it wasn't in there. So you know how we do, we just read it. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. You know what I love about the Bible? The prophecy in there can be proven by history. The Bible says that when this woman clothed in the sun, standing on the moon, stars over her, when she was about to give birth, we know that the child was Jesus, the, the dragon said, I'll, I'll devour the child. But before the dragon could get the child, God pulls it back up to heaven. That's Jesus when he goes back to be with his father. And then the woman, the Bible says, is persecuted by the dragon. Since the dragon couldn't get our leader, Jesus, then the dragon says, I'll get everybody who believed in him. But the Lord made a way for the woman. So she was taken to sparsely, thinly populated areas and if you check it in history you discover that it was in Europe that it happened and the Bible says that God protected the woman for 1,203 score years that's 1,260 years and you can go and check in your library there are not many people there go Monday go Sunday <laughs> You'll have to get some help to find it, but if you go back to history, here is what you will find. You will find that just as the Bible said, the church found itself out in the wilderness during a time when to worship Jesus became dangerous. So there were people who scattered in the woods. And beginning at 5 38 AD 538 the Bishop of Rome was freed from the control of the Ostrogoths what that means is that a religious authority began to suppress and oppress people who believed in Jesus and in order to be safe they had to run and hide now, I'll tell you what what encourages me about this there are times when I have to run and hide. But I know that if I hide with Christ, that he will protect me anywhere I go. And when he gets ready, he can call me out of hiding. Because God handles it all. So watch this. Beginning at 538, this religious authority oppressed Christians and it seemed like it would last forever there are some folk who think that if if we're not doing well now we will never do well those people who were in Babylonian captivity must have thought the same thing when when God's people are under threat some Christians don't have enough faith to hold on but I've read this book from cover to cover. Down south where I come from, they say it another way. They say, kiva to kiva. <laughs> now I know who all the southerners are, right? I just saw you react. And you will discover in this book 
that while God's people can be oppressed, while they may have to run and hide for a while, God keep his, keeps watch over us and he will never leave us alone. When Israel was in Egypt, they were never alone. God was always watching. And when the time came, he called Moses out from keeping sheep and showed him a burning bush. God will not let us be alone. He always has a plan to rescue his people. And, and when this happened in 538, God had his hand on it. So here's what happened. There was that period that's mentioned in Daniel 725. But in 1798, this is historical fact. After the victories of Napoleon Bonaparte, the French government ordered, ordered Napoleon to take that religious leader as a prisoner. General Bessier entered Rome and declared the political rule of that organization to be at an end. So all of a sudden, the people who had gone in hiding, the woman who hid in the wilderness, found herself free to come back out and to practice what she believed in, you can go check a history book and it will tell you that just as God predicted it in Revelation, that's how it happened. And what I'm telling you tonight is this. You and I are watching the confluence of prophecies. In 1844, Jesus starts final judgment. In 1798, the church is freed from this religious authority. And you begin to wonder, wait a minute, why are these things happening at about the same time? In fact, the people who had just been through what we call the great disappointment, in fact, after, after some people thought that Jesus was coming in 1844, some of them say, well, look, we'll never, ever talk about that again. Another group who were known as Adventists simply because they thought that the second advent of Christ was about to come. Those Adventists who couldn't stand the heat ran away. And they said, look, don't talk to me about Jesus coming. I got embarrassed, sold my stuff, never got it back. <laughs> People laughed at us. Look, don't come, hey, don't come here. I'm trying to get my money back together. Gave it all away. <laughs> but, but let me tell you something. If, if it's Jesus you're following, he can replace money. Huh? Sounds like somebody understands that. Jesus can replace a house. He can replace a job. He can replace transportation. So there were a few folk who stayed together, they found the truth about the Sabbath. Stick with me. There's a perfect congealing of circumstances. In fact, if, if I were one of those drama writers, I'd write fiction about this. Because now you've got in 1798 people being freed to obey God. In 1844, you've got this group who goes through the great disappointment. But now they say, hey, let's hold on to it. The, 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 the arithmetic was right. We had it right about something was going to happen. We just had the wrong thing. So let's stay together. They began to look at God's holy Sabbath, which is at the heart of the Ten Commandments. They noted that in the fourth commandment about the Sabbath, that was the only place where they found God's name, his title, and his territory. So they borrowed that and added it to the things that kept them encouraged. They began to worship on God's Sabbath. And you and I know what happens when you worship on the Sabbath. You can't stay discouraged because you're riding on the high places of the earth. You can't stay discouraged because you're being fed with the heritage of Jacob. So right about that time is where we run down from the 1798 sequence and get to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, and I need you to listen carefully now. It was at this amazingly active moment in the religious world that Jesus declares, I got me a remnant. I, um, I, I went one day to a clothing store. Preachers need to look 
okay. <laughs> you know. So I went there and uh, they made custom suits. I couldn't afford custom suits, but they had a credit plan. You should have seen me when I bought my first preacher suit. It was amazingly beautiful. It was navy mohair. When I stood in the sun, I practically glowed. In fact, I, I believe I heard a brother remark one day, look at him. <laughs> Glowing. Well, I was paying way too much for these clothes. I finally went in one day and there was a gentleman who came to me and said, sir, he said, I don't want to embarrass you. He said, but when you walk out of here, they laugh at you. Said, Why would they do that? He said, because they can tell you don't have enough money to get these custom suits. You, you are paying monthly for clothes. He said, there's something wrong with that. Don't you feel funny when you do it? I hated to admit it. I did. He said, well, I can tell you, there are wealthy people who will not pay on credit. They come in and pay cash. He said, and here you are coming in, and we can tell. We see the car you drive. We see what you look like. You can't afford these suits. He said, well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. If you come in and buy a couple more suits from me personally, he said, I'm getting ready to buy this store. He said, let me tell you what they do for the wealthy people. Now, I'm going I'm to make somebody really, really disturbed because you have already bought a suit for tomorrow. He said, the wealthy people don't buy the suits you buy. They don't pay all that money you pay. They go to the back room, and there are bolts of fabric back there. And what they do is choose something from the bolts of fabric leaning on the wall. They buy that suit for about one-fifth of what you're paying. And I felt so bad. I, I hated my blue suit from then on. <laughs> but one day I drove by and saw that the name had been changed. And I went inside, and he said, you know what I'm doing? I said, no. He said, I'm making your suit out of a remnant. You know, I'm trying to act like I know, but I said, hey, man, what, what's a remnant? <laughs> he said, that's the last on the boat. That's the last material. That's why we can sell it to you for such a wonderful price. Now, let me tell you something that I noticed about remnant fabric. When the boat comes in, it's big. And there's wonderful material all the way down. But the last material wrapped around the boat has been wrapped so tight by the other material that every design, every emblem, every imperfection in the boat can be seen in the fabric because it's wrapped tight to the boat. So I lost my pride, but I got a sermon illustration. The remnant, the last, are wrapped so close to the boat that everything that's in the boat is in the fabric. I believe that Jesus is calling for a remnant wrapped so close to him wrapped so tight to him that every feature of Jesus is represented in me I'm excited about being the remnant now when you put together these prophecies that have converged you come to understand something the difference between the regular folk who follow Jesus and those who follow him in the last days is that times in the last days are tough. Hmm? Let me tell you something. When things are going fine, you can't tell a Christian from a sinner. Huh? Anybody can say, you're a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, sure. How, how are you going to know? Everybody's blessed. Everybody's fine. Everybody's got a good job. Everybody's driving a nice car. Everybody's got nice clothes. Everybody's living in a nice house. You can't tell sinners from Christians. But you wait till times get hard. 
the Apostle Paul says, I know how to abound and I know how to be abased. He said, I don't only love Jesus when it's good. I love Jesus in the good times and the bad times. I have discovered that the Christian life is not unlike a roller coaster. You won't always be up. Huh? In fact, you ought to praise God while you're up because it is his blessings that have taken you up but don't get carried away with it because what is up will come down and what i love about my jesus is that he does not abandon me when i come down in fact i have learned more about jesus when i'm down than i learned while i was up let me tell you what i truly believe there are times that are coming. In fact, let me take you to an amazing place in the Word of God. In Revelation, there are some texts in Revelation chapter 14. Please turn there. There are some verses there that have the messages there from three angels. Now, if you read them in the King James Version, they are liable to frighten you to death. But uh, as one of my mentors says, the job of the, of the preacher is to take the gold bars of salvation, melt them down into the coin of the realm so that regular people can go out and buy groceries with them. So without sounding high-minded, I'm about to take a couple of gold bars and melt them down so you can spend them where you live. Is that all right? So if I were to start with the message of the first angel, the first angel is talking very clear to us. And the fact is that in Revelation 14, uh, look at verse, let's go to verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that, them that dwell in the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made the heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. So the first angel has a message, and I'm going to tell you what it is. Let's bottom line it. Let's cut to the chase. The first angel says with a loud voice. Somebody ought to say amen for the loud voice. Amen. I'm sure there are people who watch me on this broadcast, and think to themselves, why does he talk so loud? <laughs> well, I can tell you it's because I can't keep quiet. If somebody in your house knew that the house was on fire, would they say, hey, I think the house is on fire. That's not the way you do it. Can I hear somebody say amen? So, the first angel represents God's saints proclaiming the everlasting gospel in the midst of heaven. So the area of flight is worldwide. The people of God are called upon to share the message. I'll tell you, if you want to know what winds me up and makes me talk loud, what makes me smile, I went to Poland and nobody had seen a preacher smile like I did. They wrote questions. They said, why do you seem so happy? I said, I'm happy because I read what the hope is for every person who lives on the face of the earth. I have found me Jesus. And I'm excited about it. What would you think if I went around looking like somebody had hurt me? The fact is that when you find Christ, he gives you joy. Right after you get the first fruit of the Spirit, joy comes right after. But watch this. We are proclaiming a nation, a worldwide, a worldwide truth. And when we do that, it's with a loud voice so everybody can hear. And here's what the angel says. Fear God and give glory to him. Worship him. I'm, I'm going to... Yeah, I've got time to do this. What Jesus deserves is worship. I'm not talking about lip service. Anybody with breath can say, Hello there. My name is Walter Pearson. And, and Jesus is the captain of my life. 
easy to say. Anybody can say it. In fact, if you listen to enough people saying it, when you go around Christians, say that, and some of them will be impressed. But remember that Jesus does not look for lip service. Even in Christianity, talk is cheap. Anybody can say, I love Jesus. What Jesus deserves is worship that comes from the heart. Not just decibel level declarations. What Jesus deserves is for me to put myself on the line. Live like I love him. Don't just act like I love him. Live like I love him when I'm looking at a crowd or when I'm all alone. Because Jesus is always there. So the first angel says, worship him. And I don't know about you, is there anybody I can get in support of giving worship to Jesus? Do you believe that he deserves it? I tell you this, at the end of time, the matter will be real simple. Who will worship him in spirit and in truth? The second angel says, Babylon is fallen. It's the literal city of Babylon, which was built by Nimrod, was built against God. God told those people who lived after the flood, scatter. Nimrod said, we will not. I read where one scientist says that Nimrod and his folk were so scientifically advanced that they measured the depth of the flood and de decided they would build a building higher than the depth of the flood. That's why they built the Tower of Babel. They built it so high that they never had to obey God again because they had a building where they could climb up and up and up and thumb their nose at God's power because he could never flood them again. They forget that what God said was, won't be water. <laughs> so they built Babel and Babylon as a symbol against God. Babylon was a symbol of the ownership of the devil. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 4, and then verses 12 through 14, you will read there, it starts off saying, the king of Babylon. By the time it gets to verse 12 through 14, it says it's Lucifer. The king of symbolic Babylon is the devil. So when the Bible says Babylon is fallen, what Jesus is telling you is, I'm going to crumble Babylon. Follow the devil if you please. But my Lord is about to end this thing. The crooked places will be made straight. The rough places will be made plain. Mountains will be brought low, valleys will be exalted, and Jesus will reign forever and ever as King of kings and Lord of lords. And before he starts, he will put down Babylon. So, so look how much he loves you. He said, I'm just trying to tell you, you need to stay with me. If, if you are in my family, you will reign with me. We will reign together. You'll be, you'll be with me when I reign. So the second angel is careful. He says that if you are not careful, if you stay with the devil's kingdom, and there's no doubt about it, in those days, the gates of the city were the places where they came to give homage to the leadership. So the gates of Babylon represents the throne of the devil. Those who keep on obeying their own impulses. I'll tell you how smart the devil is. He can make you think that when you do wrong, you are doing what you chose. Yeah. Stick with me a minute. There are people who can do that. I'm not going to get too personal. There are some men right now who can't tell who decided to say, let's get married. <laughs> but you know who you are. There are some women who don't know who decided about that dress they bought. Because your mate has been watching you so long that they can say, you know, I don't like that one on you. That, that, that color doesn't... Look at this. Look here. Isn't that, isn't that nice? He said, oh, I didn't see that one. 
Oh, I thought you saw it a minute ago. Isn't this the one you saw and you like? Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> Got a question. If you know your mate well enough to make them think they thought of it, don't you think the devil's been watching you long enough to make you think you thought of it? So there are lots of people going around saying, I would not do what the Bible says. I will not tell. In no preacher can tell me what to do. I will run my own life. And the devil is, is just cracking up because he gave you the idea and made you think you thought of it. So when you think you're running your own life, when you think you're the captain of your own fate, the fact is that you are doing what the devil said. And if you keep on following the devil, Babylon is already gone. Let me tell you what God can do. He can tell you before something happens, it's done. Before Joshua went down to Jericho, before the walls came down, Joshua gave the command to the people of Israel. He said, when we go around and get to that last turn, shout. And I'm sure somebody said, well, what are we shouting for? He said, shout, because I'm telling you, what's gonna happen so before the walls fell the people of God shouted and then the walls fell when you walk with Jesus you can shout before your blessing comes because you know it's coming so so what God says is Jesus is talking he said Babylon is gone I don't want to talk like the neighborhood where I came from but I could it's done about this time tomorrow, finish. <laughs> I'm serious. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't have to pay any attention to that, but when Jesus says the, that, that Babylon is gone, you better put that in stone because he can predict before it happens what's going to happen. So the second angel says, Babylon is gone. The, the, the fact is that it has already fallen because it made everybody drink of the wine of its fornication. It made them go after false teachings. There are people who claim to believe in Jesus, but they do wrong things in his name because Babylon has taught them false things. And the fact is that the wine of her wrath has intoxicated too many people, and Jesus is tired of it, and it's about to be over. Now, I need to tell you what the third angel says because... That's some powerful stuff. I know some people who have gotten so carried away with that that they get wiped out. The power of the second beast, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, Revelation chapter 13. Watch verses 11 and 12, because I've got to show you something, and I'm looking at my time, and this is getting critical. Revelation chapter 13, got to show you this one. Revelation chapter 13, look at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. The Bible says that under the command of the third angel, which says if you worship the beast or his image, and remember the first beast says horrible things, but the second beast is a lamb-like beast that speaks like a dragon. Listen to the interpretation of this text. This wonderful nation called America. The lamb-like beast will speak like the dragon. There is coming the day. Listen, listen. Right now there are freedoms in America that are being taken away. It's not an accident. But I can tell you this. While terrible things are about to happen, trust me, those who are the faithful will never give up. Just like when Elijah was on Mount Carmel, and after the whole drama was over, he said, I'm here all by myself. And God said, I got 7,000 of the remnants who will never give in to Baal. They have never bowed their knee to Baal. 
Let me read to you now from Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. Well, let me read just a few. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth and beneath blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The fact is that God says at the end of time, when everything seems like it's about to go completely haywire, yeah. there's going to be a group of people who will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They will obey God whatever He says. And by the grace of God, I plan to be one of them. Yeah. Times are going to get difficult, but God is going to pour out His Spirit upon his last faithful ones. Just like those at Pentecost had Holy Ghost power fall on them, those who stand for Jesus in the trouble of the last days, he will pour out his spirit upon us. And I don't care what they send against us, we will stand in the power of Jesus. He will pour out his spirit and we are going to be just fine. We'll hold on until Jesus come. Now until tomorrow morning, may God hear you when you call. May God lift you if you fall. May God bless you as you stand. May God hold you in the palm of his hand.